So I'm very pleased and honored to introduce our keynote speaker, who you've already heard bits and pieces about, and I'm sure everyone in this room already knows, Dr. Tony Fauci. Um, it's really a welcoming him home, since Dr. Fauci actually comes from New York, originally from Brooklyn, I do believe, um, and did do some of his training in the New York area before going to the NIH in 1968. Some of you may not know that he started out in rheumatology um, and did some seminal work there, but then moved on rapidly to HIV, where he continues to produce prolifically um, cutting-edge scientific work, but more, perhaps more important, or probably not more importantly, but equally importantly, is as um, Harris put it, his warrior status. Um, when he took over the NIAID in 1984 um, as director, he has over the years grown that budget um, from the millions to $4.7 billion, not only advocating for HIV research, HIV treatment, HIV prevention, and now cure, but also advocating for uh, research in other areas, including emerge, emerging pathogens and, and other important areas, including defense. So he is really a leader for all of us. He epitomizes what all of us would hope to be, but only he has succeeded in doing, and he is more than a triple threat. So it is really an honor to have him here, and we're looking forward to his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really <clears throat> a great pleasure to be here for, for a number of reasons. One, it's a privilege to be part of this uh, inauguration of the uh, Einstein Rockefeller Cooney uh, CIFAR, but also to see so many old friends uh, that I've known over the years. Uh, particular shout out to Harris Goldstein, who came into my laboratory in 1983 as a fellow. Um, I knew that I was going to lose him, even though I wanted to keep him at the NIH, because in the mid-80s, uh, he and I and my wife ran the New York Marathon together. And as we were running, he was running through the streets of New York saying, I'm sorry, Tony, I got to come back here. <laughs> so I knew that was it. Anyway, it's, it's great to be here. I'm going to talk to you about this uh, subject matter that has been alluded to a, a few times already and certainly discussed in the meeting that I had with some of you just a short while ago, and that is the issue of ending the HIV AIDS epidemic and pandemic, actually. And the title that I've chosen is Follow the Science. I get a little bit anxious when I talk about this subject, particularly when I talk about it to the Congress of the United States, because whenever you talk about ending something, there's always the assumption, well, we've, we're already there, we've done it, let's move on to something else. So I have to throw that big caveat in when I talk about ending the epidemic. What I'm talking about is following the science to get us to where we are right now, but also the need to not only follow, but to implement the science to get us to where we need to be. And the end game of that is shown on this slide. So going back the 35 years and several months, I, I have a particularly personal feeling about this because we often talk about things that happened in our lives that we remember exactly where we were when they happened. I think many of us remember where we were when JFK was assassinated. I actually was in my microbiology class at Cornell Medical School in my first year. I remember very, very clearly sitting at my desk in June of 1981 at the NIH in the clinical center where my lab was seeing this report of five gay men from Los Angeles presenting with an unusual pneumonia that I was quite familiar with because I was the infectious disease consult for the cancer patients at the NIH who were on the Cancer Institute two floors up from us in the clinical center. I thought it was a fluke. I didn't know what to make of it. And then one month later, on the 3rd of July of 1981, now 26, curiously, all gay men not only from Los Angeles, but from San Francisco and New York City, who also had not only PCP, but Kaposi sarcoma and other opportunistic infections. And it was at that transforming moment that I completely turned around my career. You heard in the introduction that I was involved in using my immunology training, uh, even though I was board certified in infectious diseases, to study immune-mediated diseases. And I made a decision to essentially stop what I was doing and go ahead and devote my entire research and clinical time to admitting these young men who were all gay men at the time to my service to trying to figure out what was going on. Now, when I did that, my mentors thought I was really throwing away a very promising career. 
In fact, one in particular, Shelly Wolf, who was the person who recruited me to the NIH, told me, Tony, don't give up your day job. <clears throat> so I had to write what I call my Apologia Pro Vita Sua, which for those of you who haven't had Latin training, that means an, sort of an excuse for what you do with your life. So I sent in this article to the New England Journal of Medicine, and one of the reviewers rejected it because he said it was too alarmist. Because what I was saying was that because we don't know the cause of this syndrome, any assumption that it's going to be restricted to a particular segment of our society is truly an assumption without scientific basis. I wrote it in December of 1981, and it was published in June of 82. It wasn't named AIDS yet, and we were far from even knowing what the virus was. But that was then. Fast forward 35 and a half years, and when I wrote that paper, there were 159 cases reported to the CDC with this new strange disease, which we were calling GRID, for gay-related immunodeficiency. <clears throat> now we have 36 million people living with HIV, about 38 to 40 million dead individuals, namely people for a total of now 80 million, one million deaths a year, and two million new infections. What has changed and what has brought us to where we are right now? I wrote about it in the New England Journal of Medicine about a year and a half ago, and that's what I said was, follow the science. And if you look at the advances that have been made because of the investment on the part of we in this country, a little slow at first, but finally it caught on, so that the investment in both basic and clinical science, I could spend my entire allocated time talking to you about the advances in each one of these yellow boxes. But because of the need to con uh, contain this within a reasonable period of time, uh, I would tell you that these are the number of, pa of papers that were written on HIV. It's just amazing, over 300,000 papers. I've read every single one, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> at least the titles of every one of them. But if you were to just pick out one of those yellow boxes, I think this is something that we really need to reflect on because we argue, and it's pretty important to do it right now given the climate in Washington, we argue for the importance of investments in basic biomedical research. If there ever was a disease in which an investment in basic and clinical biomedical research spelled out transforming changes in how we treat individuals who are afflicted with this disease. It's in the arena of treatment. This is a picture of me making rounds in December of 1981 on the first few AIDS patients. And remember, we weren't calling it AIDS then, uh, shown here uh, with my fellows and students and others. Now, at this point in time, the only thing we had was observational medicine and interventional in the forms of opportunistic infections. So if individuals presented to us with advanced disease, so the median survival was anywhere from 8 to 15 months, which means that 50% of the patients would be dead in 8 to 15 months. Now, if you fast forward, and look at what the science did. The first and one of the most important things, obviously, was the discovery of the virus and the precise delineation of the replication cycle of the virus, which led to what I really called the birth of targeted antiretroviral therapy. I mean, there, there was targeted an, uh, antiviral therapy for a while. Before then, we had a cyclovir and things like that. But really, targeted antiviral therapy came into its own with HIV AIDS, in which scientists precisely delineated the replication cycle, identified the vulnerable targets, and here you see in this slide the multiple classes of drugs based on targeted therapy. And now we have more than 30 FDA-approved drugs, which when given in combination, can actually truly transform the lives of HIV-infected individuals, truly following the science. Back then, when we first had triple therapy in 1996, the patients that I was taking care of had an average of about 23 to 28 pills per day. Now you can have it one pill with three drugs in a single pill. So if we go back and in that same room, 
that I was seeing that patient, who, by the way, died about three and a half months after that picture was taken, if someone comes into our hospital, and I'm sure exactly the same thing here in New York and virtually every place else, who's in their mid-20s, will say, recently infected with HIV, I could look them in the eye and tell them, quite honestly, that if they take their medicine and adhere to the regimen, that they could live an additional 50 plus years, which means if they come in and they're 25 and they live 50 plus, they're almost at a normal lifespan. That has to go down by the work of many, many, many people as one of the most important advances in the translation of basic research to clinical endpoints, in this case, the saving of lives. We'll get to in a moment that it's not only saving lives of ill individuals, but it is also preventing HIV infection. Now, with the PEPFAR program and the Global Fund, we now have about 18 million people who are receiving antiretroviral therapy. If you do the math on that, that means that we've averted about close to 10 million deaths since the year 2000. That has led to a decline in deaths since 2003 of about 43%. So we're doing very, very well in treating individuals who are infected. The issue that I'll get to into a moment is we now have more of an implementation gap than we have in a scientific gap because we are in the interesting situation of having drugs that can actually turn around the lives of individuals but access globally, even with PEPFAR and the Global Fund, is not yet where we want it. So where do we want it? Some of you may have heard, I'm sure many of you have, of Michelle Sidibe, who has put forth this concept of 90, 90, 90 targets. That means if you diagnose 90% of the people in the world who are infected, and you take 90% of those and put them on treatment, and you take 90% of those and virally suppress them, 90% of 90% equals 73%. And when you have 73% of people who are virally suppressed and you do a mathematical modeling on it, the trajectory of the pandemic starts to do this by itself. This is without a vaccine. This is what happens if you can get those number of people on therapy together with prevention modalities, which I'll get into in a moment. So how are we doing with 90-90-90? Sweden is the first country to achieve that. Now, of course, Sweden is first in everything. They're a homogeneous country. They, got, they have it really easy. <laughs> it isn't the Bronx or inner city Washington, D.C. But we have to tip our hat to them because they got it done. But also, Botswana is almost there. Certain places in the United States, like in San Francisco, which is very aggressive, and seeking out testing and treating, they are way over that. So they're doing very, very well. New York City targets, you guys are doing real well now. So if you look at 2015 estimates and the proportion of positive participants of HIV positive people, the diagnosis is now about 90%, on art about 86, so virally suppressed of the people who were newly infected you actually are over the mark. That doesn't mean you could sit back on your laurels because you really want to get 100%. Now, drop back a few yards. How is the world doing? The world in general, with a lot of spottiness, remember Botswana up here, Democratic Republic of the Congo down here, they're only around 38%, so they have a long way to go. So that's the reason why I have some trepidation when I say ending the AIDS epidemic, because we're not really there yet, nor are we really close to there yet. Now, one of the areas where we really need to do much better is in the arena of prevention. In fact, if you look at the curves of the number of new infections, look at what happens from around 2003 to 2015, which is the last measured year. It has essentially been flat not only globally, but in the United States. If you look at the diagnosis of HIV infection among adults and adolescents, 
Look at males and females, the same thing. We really have to do better than that. And we're doing better in some subsets of the population and worse in others. For example, if you're looking at injection drug users, we're way better off now than we were 15, 20 years ago. If you're a young black man who has sex with men, we're doing worse than we were earlier on. At the end of the day, it's a net nothing. It's flat. Now, if you look at the combination prevention, I, I remember when I gave my first town hall meeting in Washington, D.C. in the very early 80s, again, even before we knew what the uh, agent was, and certainly before we had any therapy, suspecting that it was a sexually transmitted disease, what we were saying is use condoms, be careful with your sexual partners, and if you're an injection drug user, don't share needles. That's essentially all we had. But what's evolved over the decades now is an interesting interdigitation between prevention modalities and treatment modalities. And let me give you some examples of that. I don't have time to go through each and every one in detail, but I'll give you a smattering of each. The first is treatment as prevention, an extraordinary concept that is very simple, and it applies almost uniquely to HIV because among transmissible infections, it is one of the few infections that has chronic viremia for years, as opposed to using treatment to prevent an acute infection. We're all aware of the HPTN 052 trial, in which individuals who are in discordant relationships were treated and their sexual partners were given a 95 to 96 percent decrease in transmissibility if the viral load is undetectable. So that you get a twofer. If you bring somebody's viral load down, you save them morbidity and mortality, but you also prevent them from infecting their sexual partners. Four years later, we did a follow-up of 052, and it's still about 93 to 95%. Now, for those of you who are involved in clinical trials, having the same uh, percentage efficacy four years later is really good because things tend to fall off as time goes by. It really works. If you look at the situation that was recently reported in JAMA, in which about 58,000 condomless sex acts, there was no linked HIV transmissions with an HIV positive partner. Now, you never say 100% in biology, but that's really close to 100%. Now, I don't tell people not to use a condom if their partner is, is on antiretroviral therapy, but the risk of infecting your partner is extraordinarily low. Now, does it work in the community? The blue line is the suppressed virus, namely the number of people who are suppressed on antiretroviral therapy. And the red line is the incidence. Whether you're in Baltimore, as you get people on therapy, the incidence goes down. Or you could be in Rwanda. If you get people on therapy, the incidence goes down. This is a very compelling argument for putting people on therapy. However, it doesn't work every place. In an ANRS study, the test and treat strategy failed to reduce HIV incidence in a rural population, likely because of the inefficiency in seeking out and testing individuals. So we have a long way to go, even though we have the tools to do it. Pre-exposure prophylaxis is interesting because that started off a little bit controversial. Some of you may remember the original study that was done had an intent to treat efficacy of 47%. But when we looked at the individuals and asked them, did you really take your medicine? And they said, yeah, I didn't take it, and excluded those, and only included those who did. The efficacy went up to 70 plus percent. But then if you say, you know, I love you, but I don't believe you, I'm gonna draw your blood <clears throat> and see if you have a blood level, and you accounted only those with blood levels, the efficacy was over 90%. So pre-exposure prophylaxis works. In San Francisco, they are very aggressive 
about going out into the community and getting people on PrEP who need to be. And again, this is a recent result. They looked at more than 1,200 men on PrEP in a nurse-led intervention, namely very aggressive, almost a dot directly observed therapy type of thing over one and a half years. There were 82 new infections in those not on PrEP and zero infections of those on PrEP. Again, it only is not only in San Francisco or New York. If you look at Uganda, it was more than 90% efficacious when there was high adherence in Uganda. Now, what is the problem? The problem is it is grossly underutilized. The CDC did an estimate that there are about 1.2 or more adults in the United States with substantial risk for HIV acquisition that we feel could benefit from PrEP. The uptake of PrEP among eligible people in the United States is about 10%. So we really have got to go ahead and push that agenda. And there's a lot of, I think, invalid reasons not to do it, but we've really got to do it. Now, adherence is an issue with everything. That's really one of the big uh, problems that we have, both in prevention and treatment. That's the reason why we're working on things like long-acting, injectable, antiretroviral drugs. The issue of broadly neutralizing antibodies passively transferred as a means of preventing HIV infection, you're probably going to hear a lot more about it from Michelle in his talk because he's really spearheaded that area. This is going to be very important. So I would think we all need to keep our eye out on the role of passive transfer of broadly neutralizing antibodies in the treatment and prevention of HIV infection. Post-exposure prophylaxis has been around a long time. Uh, we've done very well. As of 2013, there have been only 58 confirmed and about 150 possible occupational transmissions, and only one has been reported since 1999. The reason is we have strict guidelines of post-exposure prophylaxis, so it really works. It was obviously a big problem when you're an intern or a resident or even a, an attending taking care of individuals when you're drawing blood. Right now, PEP, or post-exposure prophylaxis, is important. Now, the issue is it isn't universally implemented. Only 27% of healthcare workers in Tanzania reported exposure uh, on exposure received this drug. 72% of these with a needle sick. 25% of them sought advice. So we got to push that a bit. One of the great successes in prevention, and that antedated the treatment as prevention, was prevention of mother to child transmission. You remember back in 1994, the iconic 076 study, which showed that if you treat women during pregnancy for weeks in the second and third trimester and treat the baby for weeks following birth, that you could dramatically decrease the incidence of transmission perinatally. In the United States, it was about 25%, 27%. In the developing world, it was about 35%. You tack a few more percent on that for breastfeeding. However, that's all changed now because today, since you should treat everybody who's HIV infected, you treat a woman because she's infected, not just to protect the baby. But in the meanwhile, you have dramatically decreased the transmission perinatally by treating all pregnant women or any woman who's infected. In fact, if you look at newly infected children with HIV globally, in the 1990s, it was about 600,000. It has been a 75% reduction. Now, remember, when Hillary Clinton came to the United States and, and coined that phrase, came to the NIH, and coined that phrase, an AIDS-free generation, the definition was no child born with HIV infection as one of the three limbs of that, in addition of decreasing the incidence and getting anybody who's infected on therapy. So this was an important success story. Now, that's where we are, that's what we've done, and those are the challenges. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, when you live in Washington, D.C., in the political scene, you go to a lot of dinners with the press and the congressmen, and, so, and I was at a dinner uh, in Northwest D.C., and I was sitting down next to one of the editors of the Washington Post, 
And I must have been in a particularly passionate mood. And I was going on, you know, waving my hands about what I'm doing right now. This poor guy was trying to eat his calamari, and he kept on saying, listen, <laughs> enough. Why don't you write a, an editorial for the Washington Post? And I did. And I titled it uh, rather boldly that there's no more excuses. We have the tools to end the, the, the pandemic. And it really is up to us to have the political, economic, and moral will to go ahead and do that. Now, having said that, I can't just say thank you very much and finish because we do have scientific challenges. And the scientific challenges, I don't have time to go into great details, but let me just frame them for you. One is addressing HIV persistence. Notice I don't use the word cure because I think cure often gets misinterpreted about what is it that you're striving for. I look more like if you're striving for an art-free remission, you have to address HIV persistence. And the other is the development of a safe and effective vaccine. So let's start off with the first. Back in the late 1990s, after it was clear that antiretroviral therapy would bring down the viral load for years to be undetectable, and with the kinetic studies that came out of David Ho's lab, there was the projection that maybe if you do that kinetic uh, mathematical model after three or four years, the reservoir would disappear. Now, unfortunately, that didn't happen because we didn't fully appreciate the nature of the reservoir. So what we did, and we were the first to do it, not that it's a big deal being the first to do it, but we did, we empirically discontinued therapy in a group of our patients who had been on therapy for well over three years. And the fact is, every single one of them rebound. We've done a lot of studies on this trying to, quote, suppress the reservoir to no avail. Now, there are two ways of addressing persistence. One is to eradicate the reservoir, which we refer to as a classical cure. And the other is to control viral rebound by some method or other. So let's take a look at eradicating the reservoir or classic cure. Again, there are four major ways of doing this. There's latency reversing, immunotoxic, stem cell trans uh, transplantation, and gene editing. Now, again, I don't have the time, and Harris knows I always stay on time, I, I don't have the time to go through each and every one of these, but I have to say that these are very difficult things to accomplish. We encourage, and I'm doing it myself, working hard to see if you could flush out the reservoir. We tried, we failed. Immunotoxic therapy, stem cell transplantation, not feasible for 36 million people, particularly if you have to condition them, transplant them, and then immunosuppress them. Gene editing is elegant, wonderful science. Is it going to work? I'm not sure. What I think might be a little bit more feasible is controlling viral rebound, or what I refer to as sustained virological remission. And one of the ways that it's important to do that is to get people on HIV therapy, antiretroviral therapy, as early as you possibly can to limit the size of the reservoir. Then there are multiple things that you can do. There's natural immunity. Namely, if you treat somebody early enough and stop therapy, will they, in fact, not rebound? Well, we proved that, in this case, that you couldn't. The Mississippi baby, the Visconti study, all of those showed that sooner or later, people rebound. Now, the Visconti study was a good study. And as a matter of fact, we found out that in some of our patients treated early, we still had the same thing. There's more of a percentage of people that don't rebound for months, if not years. The other is therapeutic vaccines. We have a trial going that I'm going to report on in Paris next month of a therapeutic vaccine. Again, not as good as we'd like to see. The other is the passive transfer of HIV-specific antibodies. And I'm just going to talk about this lightly. I know Michelle, who's led this field, is going to talk about it. We have a whole bunch, more than 200, of monoclonal antibodies that were gotten from the cloned B cells of HIV-infected individuals. That's the good news. The sobering news is that if you're HIV-infected, only about 20% of people make broadly neutralizing antibody, and it usually takes about two years of constant viremia in order to induce it. That's not good news for a vaccine, that you have to have that much antigenic stimulation, and it occurs in only 20% of the individuals. However, what those antibodies have actually showed us, and these are 
a paper done right here by Michelle uh, and Marina and others uh, at the Rockefeller, as well as the group, uh, my own group, uh, together in a collaboration with Pablo Tebas, we found that when you passively infuse broadly neutralizing antibody, you can delay the rebound of plasma viremia. It comes back, but you delay it. So the goal is in the future to get a combination of antibodies and to give it intermittently so that you can pick people off ART and they may hopefully need to come in for a passive transfusion like a common variable immunodeficiency that would need gamma globulin every X number of months. Now there was another study that was done with Mal Martin and, and Michelle, and I was a, a, a small part of that, in which in an animal study in the macaque, antibodies were infused in, an in, in, in the animals, and what happened is that they didn't rebound. So what was induced was an interesting response that suppressed the virus from rebounding, which means that passive transfer of antibody by some mean or another, very likely antigen presentation, induced a very interesting immune response. Again, you'll probably hear more about that in, in, in a bit. But let me move on and close with the issue of a vaccine. The approach to an HIV vaccine is twofold. One is an empiric approach, classic vaccinology. The other is more of a theoretical or deductive approach. The empirical or what I call the inductive approach, is to say that what I learned in medical school is the best way to make a vaccine is to mimic natural infection without harming the host. Because no matter what disease that you pick, natural infection, you want to recapitulate natural immunity. Take any of these diseases, smallpox, polio, measles. Some of them have great morbidity. Some of them have a lot of mortality. However, in all of them, the overwhelming majority of people not only recover, they clear the virus and they're left with long-lasting immunity against infection from a similar identical virus. So the best way to make a vaccine is just mimic natural immunity. Unfortunately, with HIV, we can't do that. Why? Because natural immunity is terrible. It really does not protect you against anything. In fact, there isn't a single example of someone who has completely cleared the virus by the immune response. So the body doesn't like to make a good immune response. You've got to do better than natural immunity. So in empiric trial, you try multiple candidates. We did. Many failed. One gave a modest at best response, 31%. It was the RV144 trial in Thailand. But what we were able to do was to use that to identify a correlative immunity, and now that we know that it is a, believe it or not, non-neutralizing antibody against a particular region in the V2 loop of the envelope with likely ADCC activity, that that's what we're trying to expand upon by increasing the strength, the breadth, and the durability, but multiple boost, modified vectors, and adjuvants, and in fact, we've gone into a trial in Southern Africa in 5,400 individuals that we started last November, and hopefully we'll be able to get a good response. The other is the theoretical approach. That's the opposite. What that is, you make an assumption. And the assumption that you make is that broadly neutralizing antibody induced by a vaccine will in fact afford protection. Now, what about broadly neutralizing antibodies? As I mentioned, the body does not like to make them. So what is going on now is an extraordinary amount of work in a number of laboratories to try and figure out, can these broadly neutralizing antibodies be induced by a vaccine? And that has created an incredible amount of activity centered around looking at the naturally occurring broadly neutralizing antibodies, which have identified what we call neutralizing epitopes that are now extensively studied by a number of laboratories. And the critical issue, and, and again, I could spend the entire time just talking about this, is how do you get those neutralizing epitopes into an immunogenic form to induce broadly neutralizing antibody? That is gonna be one of the most important scientific challenges that we faced. So having said all that, let me close with this last slide. And that is, I believe strongly, that the combination of treatment, 
plus non-vaccine prevention with or without a vaccine, and I think to durably end the epidemic, we're gonna have to have a vaccine. But importantly, it's the implementation of these proven scientific tools then and only then are we going to get a durable end to the AIDS pandemic. And so the science got us to where we are now, and we're gonna to have to rely on the science to get us over the goal line. Thank you. I have this one as well. He goes for So Dr. Fauci, you spoke about the most challenging um, molecular cha uh, in obstacles in uh, producing a cure or a vaccine. What are the most indolent behavioral challenges uh, that face uh, either treatment or prevention? Okay, well, I mean, that's a big subject, but I think you could kind of reduce it. The most important challenges in treatment are twofold, is access to disenfranchised populations that don't have ready access to health care. I mean, this is intimately connected with access to health care. The other, which is what we're trying to work on with things like long acting, is adherence. It is very difficult, even when you have a life-saving drug, for somebody to take a medicine every single day. And adherence is difficult. So it is access to people and adherence. With regard to prevention, I think it's very important to get everybody into a situation where they can be counseled. And there's a tremendous amount of stigma associated with HIV infection. Still some residual stigma in the United States but in some countries, a lot of stigma. There are dozens of countries in which homosexuality is outlawed. It's very difficult to get people in to counsel them about behavior or to get them on pre-exposure prophylaxis when to admit that you're gay is gonna throw you in jail. In Uganda, they even go crazy enough to say they could you know, give somebody a life sentence for that. So there are, there are sociological and medical impediments to both treatment and prevention. Yeah. Hi. As always, Tony, a great talk. Um, since you just mentioned stigma and we, and we know the challenges of that, I was just wondering if you would care to uh, comment on the sort of advocacy and public health campaigns around U equals U, uninfectious equals untransmissible. <clears throat> and from your scientific perspective, how do you respond to the community groups that are really, and New York City and a lot of cities are actually pushing that message that if you are uninfectious, I mean, uh, if, you are un, if you are suppressed, um, that you, if, you know, if you have retained suppressed, suppressed viral load, that you really are uninfectious. Yeah. I mean, how do, you, how do you respond to that message? You've made a comment about it as a physician. You wouldn't say abandon condoms necessarily. Right. But where's the balance in the messaging? Well, th that's a great question and a tough question because it's one whose answer always offends somebody. I have never, I have never not answered that question without somebody sending me a nasty email. So what the hell, I'll get some nasty emails. So in reality, it depends on your level of risk. Um, the fact is that if you are truly undetectable, which, you know, if you measure your viral load every day and you know you're undetectable, the chances of transmitting infection are so low as to be almost zero. So people like to see you equals you, right, undetectable, equals uninfectable. There's a considerable truth to that. The only problem with that is that I have patients that I see who are undetectable, first visit, second visit, third visit, and then all of a sudden the fourth visit, they blip up to 4,000. The next time you see them, boom, they're right back down. What was it? Was it a viral infection, a little flu, a little something? So if you absolutely know that you are undetectable, then you probably are okay, unprotected. However, you're not sure you absolutely know. And then it gets to the level of risk that you're willing to take. If you're saying, you know, the chances are so small, 
it means so much to me to have this kind of normal relationship that I'll take the chance. And others who are risk adverse say, no way am I going to do that. And that's the reason why what happens is that sometimes you get people who were infected on antiretroviral suppressed and the partner goes on PrEP. And, and we have a number of people who do that. Uh, Dr. Fauci, wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a question in terms of PrEP and, uh, and some individuals who may be, um, uh, who Truvada may not work for them. They've, they've exhausted that avenue and another person gets infected with a virus that now does not respond to Truvada. Is that a vehicle for new infections? Yeah, I mean, obviously there have been now individual, and more than anecdotal, they've actually been reported cases of people who have been infected while on Travada with Travada resistant microbes. And do you enhance the evolution of resistance uh, if you use it widely? And the answer is, if you follow the guidelines, you can certainly induce resistance if you start on PrEP and you're infected already, because you are definitely going to select for a resistant virus. And that's one of the reasons why, as part of the guidelines, that you need to see a physician or a healthcare provider every three or four months to get tested and to see if you have a sexually transmitted disease. Because as you probably know, that people who are taking PrEP and not using a condom have a higher incidence of syphilis and gonorrhea and other sexually transmitted diseases. 